F-Hubs today about continuous delivery and about immutable servers and what it all, if you mush them all together, what comes out of it in the end. Um, and I, I, during this presentation, actually, I just want to show you that it doesn't matter what you committed yesterday or, as the title says, last summer, who really cares, and which bit failed afterwards and what deployment you had beforehand. And if you're using continuous delivery and immutable servers, then this fear of deploying is going to go away in the end. So my name is Mo Taiba. I work for ThoughtWorks, a consulting company. Um, we're, we're about 3,500 people in a company, so I'm just a very small part of it. Uh, my official title is DevOps Birth Assistant. That, that is my actual business card. I have them in my pocket. Um, so birth assistant is like a midwife. It's just a male pronunciation, essentially. So I bring babies onto the world. I bring software babies onto the world, not real babies. Um, and I'm using DevOps you, uh, uh, while doing that. And that's why I gave this title on my business card. Um, you could call me a DevOps advocate as well. And um, but that's really boring, right? So, and I love talking about DevOps. I love talking about all of the benefits that it has and the technology that is inspired by it. And uh, this, Defo this talk is about DevOps and technology that's in that is inspired by it and what it makes possible in the end. Um, but since we're all talking about DevOps in the very beginning, let's maybe get all on the same page what it actually is, right? Because what is it anyway? What is it really? Um, there's so many definitions, there's so much, and there's so much different understanding about what DevOps actually is, what it entails, what it is within an organization. Uh, there are people who are calling, them, calling themselves DevOps, DevOps engineers, there are DevOps agencies, but in the end, that is really not what I think DevOps is and that what we should understand under DevOps because mostly it's a buzzword. It's misunderstood most of the time. Um, for example, take a DevOps engineer. What is a DevOps engineer? Is he advancing the cause and ideal and idea of DevOps through engineering? Most of the time, a DevOps engineer is just another specification for an infrastructure engineer or an operations engineer or a engineer which is responsible for keeping services up 24-7. But really, a dedicated DevOps engineer, that is totally against what DevOps is actually all about. So, but to understand why people call them DevOps engineers, or what we understand about DevOps in general, is that we have to understand where we are actually coming from. So I started off with, with ops, or infrastructure, as you call it today. And that was almost 18 years ago. So, uh, and the world was different at a time. And what we were coming from is this. So you were developing as a regular developer, you were developing in a team of front-end developers, maybe even back-end developers in the same team, maybe even in separate teams. And then you committed your code and you moved on to some, something else, right? So you said, it worked on my machine, all tests ran, it's fine, period, that's it. So and then some other team, maybe even in another department, maybe in another building, maybe on another country, maybe in another continent took over, took your code and tried to squeeze it in a hole where it makes sense and actually reach the customer at one point in time. There was a disconnect. You essentially, you were two departments so far away from each other that sometimes you would cancel each other out. You would deploy your code and sometimes it would fail, sometimes it would not. But in the end, you never ended up talking to each other because you all had to solve your own problems. It was never one single problem. It was two problems from, uh, apart from each other. Writing code, deploying code. So the, this, these projects that were suffering from this kind of disconnection usually ended up in bug tracking tools, in project management tools, in meetings, you know, shouting at, at each other, writing emails back and forth, maybe you know, shouting on the phone, whatever you, whatever you can imagine. And this didn't really work out in the end because technology by itself changes so frequently and the scope of a project changes as well. I mean, you, you, know what I'm, well, you know what I'm talking about, right? So if you work on a project, you have a certain scope defined for a story, for example, and after two weeks you come back from vacation and suddenly your team has a whole other scope in the confines of the same story. Because suddenly your project manager just comes back and says, well, I talked to another department and I said we needed feature B as well, not just feature A. And I just put it in because it's really, it's a tiny change. I don't know if you've ever seen this kind of uh, uh, model of this iceberg uh, inside the water. If you know that what the top of an iceberg is really just a tiny part of something and the iceberg goes on for far more beyond the surface. That's essentially what the scope change is, right? So it's just, it's a tiny change at the very beginning, right? And then suddenly you realize, okay, there's a lot more under the hood, essentially. So, as I said, uh, um, we're coming from an environment where inherently 
um, you split up the responsibility for these, these two types of things, developing and deployment. So you end up, at some point in time, you're asking yourself, but what's really the alternative then? So what can we do differently? Well, it's actually a pretty easy answer. And the easy answer would be to just come together. Actually sit in one room, actually work on something at the same time, and figure out what is uh, actually hindering the other side from working efficiently. And this is what DevOps is, working together. It's about collaborating. It's about delivering a product and value to a customer. Essentially, it's this. And if you recognize it, this is Wikipedia. This is the definition of synergy. Now, if you listen to marketing a lot, you'll always hear, oh, this, is, this has synergy effects beyond uh, our understanding, right? So synergy is always something that is used in terms of describing something which is really, really good. And most of the time, it's a word which, just as DevOps, is used in a misrepresentation. But for this instance, I would say it actually encompasses what we are trying to solve pretty clearly. DevOps is about collaborating, it's about communicating, and it's about teamwork. And if you do all of that right, then you uh, actually create synergy effects which will drive your product through the usual or, or over the usual bumps and into the hands of your customers, which are then creating value. And so you're creating direct value for your customers. To sum this up, DevOps is largely about the right attitude. So you have to trust your team to do the right things once you come together. And you have to give feedback constantly and continuously. And you have to share the knowledge that you're actually uh, accumulating during that time often and with everybody. It's about the right team chemistry. So specialists in a team are always going to be a given thing, right? So you, can, you, you feel like you're a JavaScript engineer, you feel like you're a software front-end developer or you're a back-end developer, or maybe you like infrastructure. That's all okay. The only thing is, uh, please be open to change and please be open to your team. Share what you were able to do and try to, try to make the best of it with your, with your teammates and with whoever you're working on something. And lastly, it's about the right tools for the job. You shouldn't be afraid to diversify, diversify most of the times. Use other tools on a regular basis. So maybe not just Jira or Confluence, uh, talking about Atlassian. Maybe get some, something else set up uh, from time to time. Don't get embroiled in this usual hammer and nail issue, right? So you all, if all you have is a hammer, everything resembles a nail, and you always just want to hammer down each and every bug or each and every issue with just this one hammer that you have. But if you have a toolbox available to you, why don't you use something else to actually solve the issue at hand, right? Would be the easier thing to do instead of just trying to squash everything with one single simple tool. And if you're applying this, if you're applying these approaches that I just mentioned, and you're doing DevOps, uh, DevOps right, then I think everybody is sold on this. There is no arguing around that the idea of DevOps is something that actually brings value not just to your company or to your teams, but actually for somebody who is at the end of the line, which is your customer. At the end, we're not writing code for ourselves, but we're writing code for a product that is later on then used by somebody else, and somebody else likes it, and that's what brings us satisfaction. And at the end of the road, also, if you're working for a company, also money. That's always a sad reality, but we're dealing with money most of the time. So, if we're, I've, I've basically just spent the first couple of minutes to talk about DevOps, and I uh, think that's important because DevOps is a foundation of what continuous delivery and immutable servers are based on. Without DevOps, continuous delivery and immutable servers, and both of them together, don't really make sense. You're going to run into issues if you don't actually have a healthy DevOps, a DevOps uh, atmosphere or the healthy DevOps teams. So, but uh, let's, let's jump on the first topic that I want to discuss during this presentation, which would be continuous delivery. What, what is it really? I mean, inherently, it's another buzzword, buzzword right? So you throw continuous delivery into the, into the mix, and suddenly people say, yeah, cool, it's awesome, you know, all my changes get deployed directly. But what is really in the mix of what you need to, to, to achieve this kind of process, nobody really talks about. And I, I'm, I'm trying to change something uh, with this presentation. I'm trying to show you a way of how to actually reach a point where you, where you can tell yourself, OK, this really is something that is continuous, and it's delivering something to, to my customers. Um, but for an actual definition, let's jump to one true source of information for all of us, which, again, is Wikipedia, right? So um, it essentially is about building and testing and releasing software faster and more frequently. That's what continuous delivery is. 
It's not about the, the technical process in the background. It's about actually reaching a goal and having a goal set in your mind. It's more value for customers and faster. And I mean, that's, I think, what, we ever, what everybody wants, right? We want to get rid of this issue because it's, it's hampering our progress. Um, I think everybody should want that at one point in time. It's about simple incremental changes in tiny steps instead of one huge bloated change that you never actually get a hold of, right? If you have to zip through one branch which, cont which contains 200 commits, you're never going to find that one point in time where the bug actually crept in. But you actually want to do tiny incremental changes because if then something breaks, you can figure out, ah, oh, it might be the last commit that I just you know, pushed to production. That's, that's what you want. That's not, that's not you know, uh, an ideal. It's something that everybody essentially wants throughout the development cycle. And uh, what this gives you is actually time to focus on the actual issues, with, which is writing good and clean code, and writing code that benefits people the most. And you can achieve this through these tiny incremental steps. You can achieve this using DevOps and continuous delivery. Now, for an actual visualization of what this means, this is one of them. So this is a continuous delivery pipeline this is actually a graph from what is called GoCD, which is an open source continuous delivery software program. It's much like Jenkins, CloudBees, whatever you want to call it. But this one is set in pipelines. So um, if I call this the manifestation of continuous delivery lifecycle, I would say then you have these release pipelines. You can see them on a diagram here. And they're taking the modified source code from whatever repository that we have. Might it be Git? Might it be SVN? or whatever service you have, like GitHub or Bitbucket, and they're initiating a build on each commit. So every time you commit, there's a new build running within one of these pipelines. And then this build is getting integrated and tested. So you're writing tests for your build, you're writing tests for, for after the code has been deployed, and within this pipeline, this is getting run automatically. Um, it's then possibly getting deployed to a staging environment, for example. Maybe you want to test this before deploying it to production. Maybe you want to ha have an environment where people can actually take a look at some changes that need acceptance, design changes, for example. Or maybe you just want to experiment. And in the end of the pipeline, you're essentially converging on a single point, which usually is your production system. So you're integrating all of these different parts, you're building one single image, you're pushing it out, and suddenly the same changes that you had before within the pipeline end up on a system that actually develops, delivers value to your customers. And this is continuous delivery. That is what it's all about. Um, there's no more release planning that you usually have. There's no more release schedules or release angst or being afraid of releasing or firefighting at all. This is what it's about. Ideally, all these steps are well-defined, right, logically, and as they are separated. And then if what you have right here, described maybe even in software, is the LDR representation of continuous delivery. Unfortunately, obviously, to reach this point in time and also this logical separation, there are a few steps that you have to take along the way and you have to take, be aware of if you're trying to reach that goal. So I already mentioned it, tiny steps. Your software stack that you have and the design that you have behind your software needs to support this approach. So continuous delivery doesn't work if you have a monolith which, is, which takes five hours to build and another one 10 hours to build your tests. That really cannot be called continuous delivery, it would be more called interrupted delivery, right? It would be like, okay, I commit something and then tomorrow at the same time after T, I'll probably be able to look at the changes. That's, that's fine, right? No, not really. Uh, this gigantic mess that you're developing or that you're deploying is hardly continuous delivery enabled. Um, so I don't necessarily argue for microservices in this instance, since that's another thing which is really complicated and complex. We had Simon today talk about it, right? So just answering this question with microservices is not going to be the right thing. You have to think about your software design. This also means you can still do monolith monolithic software development. You just have to think in a sense that this has to fit to a certain window within the continuous delivery lifecycle, right? Another thing is healthy code needs to be within a continuous delivery environment, which means your code needs to have t a test coverage which is above average to ensure delivering delivery of that code. So, and healthy code implies and also instills confidence and trust. You can trust your code and you write tests to trust your code. And you can then deliver it anywhere. And I think what's important, and that's why I put it on the slide, is this is not a job for QA, that's your job. You as a software developer are the ones responsible for being able to trust your own code. 
This is not I write some function and then somebody else is going to go over it and write some tests for it and then it's going to end up and it's going to be fine, right? No, QA are like mad scientists, essentially. They're prodding holes into your every move, into your every code move, essentially. They're coming up with ideas how to break your systems and how to actually challenge you on a software level that you haven't thought of before. So that you can write tests for those occasions as well, which makes it more resilience and you gain more trust in what you're actually doing, which makes delivery even easier. So, and if you trust your code, then you can deliver your code also on pretty much any environment. You should not be able to afraid to deliver your code on the production, for example, and that I mean immediately by the push of a button from code gets committed to deployment on production. There should not be a trigger somewhere. There is no red button that you can run to and suddenly press and your code ends up with production. No, it happens automatically because all the tests that you've written give you the trust to deliver your code anywhere. Um, because if there actually was a button that you could press somewhere, that would be interrupted delivery. I've seen it. It's fine. You know, there might be an occasion, an exception to a rule where you can do that, but usually you should opt for continuous delivery. Um, and for, for accounting for some of, the, for some of the, the pitfalls that you usually have when you're deploying new code to production, obviously, you can use other, method, other methods like feature toggles. Feature toggles are a good thing. And they're not a silver bullet to actually counter being afraid against releasing on production, but it's something to help you at least keep away from this usual pitfall of having to deploy again and again and again and again. Another thing is own up to your accomplishments. Ownership is important. You build that code and you run that code. And if you wrote code in the very beginning, you should be the one debugging it in the end, right? There is no other team that does the debugging for you. Um, it's your baby, as I mentioned in the beginning. You're delivering that. It, you, it's your responsibility. You have to take care of it. Otherwise, it's not going to flourish. And coincidentally, if you think about that, it also incre increases the awareness of people for QA and for testing. Because usually that includes on-call duty. Yes, on-call duty for regular software developers. You, sh you should enable your team to own up to their mistakes, which means also getting called up at night at 4 a.m., getting out of bed and fixing a bug that you introduced the last day, which is now getting hit by your customers. So um, don't, don't blame anyone in that instance, right? You should figure out what went wrong and try to go back to your team and say, hey, I made a mistake or somebody made a mistake. Let's fix that and let's figure out how we can prevent this from occurring in the future. Very, very important. Failing is part of everybody's nature. Everybody fails. I don't know how many times I've failed in my life when it comes to software development or infrastructure deployment. There were horrendous mistakes in there, but I learned from that and you should enable your team to do the same. Ownership is part of that. Also very important is that you have to be a little bit bolder than you'd, you would usually be without Cortez delivery. Try out new things. Don't overthink or tinker too much. And for example, get an MVP started of an idea that you have. Convince people to actually try out something and build it through a continuous delivery pipeline. Write a proof of concept or write multiple proof, proof of concepts. Throw the one away that doesn't actually fit your idea. Maybe time box it, give it a clear and, and concise uh, uh, time frame that you have, and then take the right one out of a pool and decide to develop it further. So, if you use these methods that I just summed up essentially, then you will end up loving continuous delivery because it'll enable you to deliver something which is beyond what you would usually do. You're more flexible when it comes to releases, for example. You're able to release constantly instead of on point or scheduled. You take ownership over what is yours. It's your responsibility to build it after all, right? Um, and failures can be dealt with in a swiftly manner, which means you can uh, zone in on what's wrong and you can immediately go back to another state uh, uh, which, is, which is beyond the point that you're currently at. And you don't have to keep up with the release schedule anymore. It is basically just committing your code and seeing how it works in production. And you can finally concentrate on what matters most, which is writing reliable, efficient, and effective, well-tested code. That's what we all want. So I've talked about continuous delivery, uh, but this is a two-parter, right? So if we go for all the benefits of continuous delivery and we throw in the second part, which is immutable service, what do we actually get? 
What is the combination of the two? The core concept of immutable service is essentially that you get an artifact not just for your software through a pipeline, right? a software build that you deploy somewhere, and at the same time, you also get an artifact which includes your infrastructure configuration. So if you actually take a point in time where you deployed something, you're not deploying just your software, you're also deploying everything that is connected to your software which makes it run, which means the infrastructure below it. That's what immutable servers are. If you deploy something new, you throw the artifact away, you recreate everything that you created before, including the infrastructure, it's one encapsulated product that you deploy to your customers. They're one single artifact. So it sounds, at first it sounds interesting, right? To be in such a commanding position, to be able to accurately specify a moment in time where something worked and not just because the software worked, but because the underlying platform worked as well. But in the end, there are a couple of advantages why people usually, uh, that you people usually ask me about and I would love to tell you about. So the other few good reasons for immutable infrastructure are, for example, that there's no server rot. What I call server rot is you have installed that server a year ago and you put it in a compartment somewhere and then you, uh, you uh, right now you're getting up to it again, you're logging in, you're finally realizing, oh, they haven't run updates on this for a year. That's not happening with continuous delivery because it's not possible. What you're building is something, a point in time, which is a representation of this point in time, which means if the software build is running, then it's up to date. The next time the pipeline is running, the infrastructure image is, is up to date again. And if you're actually doing continuous delivery, which means at least one or two commits a day, I would at least hope so, um, then your infrastructure is also continuously updated. It's no more rotting somewhere in the basement, it's actually running on new changes each and every time. I think this is one of the largest advantages that you have, is that you have atomic deployments, what I would call atomic deployments. It's not actually that you're rolling back a software change if something doesn't happen the way that it's supposed to, but you're rolling back a state, a state of something which is atomic. So once you actually pull out a software change, you're pulling out all of the other changes as well that have been done to the infrastructure, and you're deploying it again, and you can be sure, since it worked before, that it'll work again. I think that's a huge bonus of having this immutable infrastructure approach. The other one is that integration is easy, even across environments, today especially. Um, you have cloud environments. Most people use it in one way or another these days. And you can build immutable infrastructure on pretty much any cloud provider that is today. For AWS, for example, you build AMIs, as easy as that. You can build ISOs for other hosting providers that you don't have direct access to when it comes to persistent storage. You can build VM images that you can pretty much run on any cloud. You can build even Docker images if you want to, if you don't that kind of container stuff, I don't know. Um, I mean, containers, after all, that's what they were made for, right? It's, it's one single point in time that you're covering, and you're be keeping it continuously updated. That's what they're about. It's about identical environments everywhere, no matter where they are. So this means, you can de deliver an image to your developers first, for example, which is identical to the image that you're deploying on production. And that, that's, that's a huge, 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 huge bonus to your whole development process, because suddenly there are no more, no, no more diverging environments. You're running the same code that you would run on the production on your local dev machine. Coming from an infrastructure background, this is actually one of the, one of the largest advantages for me. Right? So I used to be in teams where I would be the guy who would woken up at night at 4 a.m. and actually fix something in the production build or rolled it back or whatever. But if you practice immutable infrastructure, then ops become devs and dev become ops. Because if you can define a state of your software in time, not just for software itself, but also for the infrastructure, then it's, you can write it uh, as a code the same, at the same time that you write your software. It makes operations and infrastructure a part of your software delivery platform, and it enables ownership beyond software maintenance. So this is you just don't own up to software code, you can also own up to the infrastructure code, uh, if you're an ops or a developer. And if continuous delivery applies to infrastructure as well, it also belongs in the same de development process. So it's no longer, I'm going to deliver software A and we're going to deploy it at some point in time. No, you're developing a platform 
at the same time. So you're thinking, OK, if I deploy this tool in this image, then I need to write that code as well. And it's one single image that I can de deploy somewhere. It makes sure everybody is capable of taking over responsibility and claiming ownership. So it's not just, I can't, you know, I don't want to do infrastructure. No, it's part of the development process. And the opposite, no, I don't want to do software development. No, sorry, but that's part of your code, essentially. It's one package that you get. Now, if you're taking continuous delivery and immutable infrastructure and you put them both together, you get, as I said, atomic deployments, something, a state defined in time that you can then deliver to your developers as well to production. But in order to make sure that it actually works and it works in any environment, you need another thing, which is monitoring and logging. Because if you don't enable your developers to actually see their mistakes or see or learn from their mistakes by taking a look at data and making data-driven decisions, then you're going to fail at some point in time and fail miserably. So it's essential to know when your pipeline, for example, in one of the environments fails. And it's this, this aggregated logging that you usually get from, from the logging data that makes it possible for you to, to look into what happens with your code um, that you haven't accounted for actually before. And if you're on call, as we go back to the story at 4am, you will also appreciate a monitoring system which will tell you immediately what's wrong instead of just having to grab through logging files or having to uh, uh, gather things through a shell immediately, right? So monitoring and logging makes failing fast and also recovering fast way easier. If you can pinpoint on a dashboard at a specific moment in time where something went wrong, you just push a button, you roll back your system through a pipeline, and you restore a state at which the system still behaved uh, unerratically or was performing well. So, and the continuous delivery and immutable servers allow for that, right? You can just push a button somewhere and actually is rolled back in time. You restore this one atomic state that I that I talked about before. And you just need to know when and how, and that's where monitoring and logging, logging comes in. Because visibility itself is the key to this, right? You have to make it visible. And uh, in order for that to, to actually occur, you have to be sure which metrics to track and which system to take a look at, obviously, but that's part of the issue. So, um, and I think one of the major things is also what people usually tend to, to underestimate is that you should make it visible not just for your developers through some command line tool, but also for everyone else. That's what dashboards are for, right? So if your product manager actually can take a look at a dashboard, it's not just trust for your own self or for your own code, but you can also basically put that trust into others because they can suddenly see, hey, there's something wrong. Yes, you might be bothered by somebody who's taking a look at a dashboard and says, hey, there's something going on, right? But in the end, that is something that also benefits you because the sooner somebody recognizes a pattern within your code that isn't behaving the way it's supposed to, it's even better. You can squash that bug immediately. So I would vote for making data visible. Continuous delivery and immutable servers allow for that through a very easy process and without barriers and impediments. And uh, since we're talking about atomic states, that is actually easy to do instead of having to rely on changes that are being pushed again and again and again and again. So I talked a lot about what I think continuous delivery and immutable servers are like. But I want to give you a short demonstration of what it actually looks like. So I have this app, which in this case is just called Hello World. And what it does is it gives you back Hello World on a website. That's the easiest thing that you could possibly do. And uh, it's on GitHub. So um, you can take a look at it if you want to. It's in here. And uh, the only thing it does is it, it starts this little Ruby script on the server that I'm, that I'm actually committing and has a document root, which is serving index.html. And if it's terminated, it shuts down. As easy as that. So nothing really fancy, but it, it gives you an indicator of what it actually does. So this is the index.html. It's a bunch of uh, very embarrassing CSS code that I wrote. And in the end, it's just one H1, which is going, going to give you back a uh, hello world. So what this does is, once you pick it up through a pipeline, it uses a system which is called SnapCI. SnapCI is a continuous delivery uh, software as a service platform. And this enables you to write, to write something which is called stages. 
and it, within a pipeline. And it, each of these stages can basically represent one state of your application throughout your development process. So in this pipeline, for example, the first thing I'm doing is I'm testing the actual, uh, I'm testing the actual application. Then I'm uploading an artifact to S3 on AWS, and then I'm uh, triggering a deployment of the application on my production system, as you would call it. And um, that is on AWS, as you can see here, there is a CloudFormation template. Um, if you've never dealt with AWS, then um, you should look up AWS and CloudFormation. I, this is too much to cover for me right now. If you've worked with AWS, CloudFormation is essentially a tool uh, written in JSON to interface with each and every service that AWS has. So you have in this JSON definitions for pretty much anything that I want to create within one AWS account. So for example, we have here our VPC, we have subnets defined, there's an internet gateway which is going to enable us to see this application from the internet. We have routings, everything that you need to set up if you want to set up a, uh, uh, an actual application on AWS. And um, it has a load balancer, an auto scaling group, and at the end, we're also creating, uh, um, we're also creating a root 53 record, which is the one that we're surfing to right now. And uh, if you run this JSON file through CloudFormation, you'll get the same exact instance again and again and again, just fetching a different artifact each time, because that's one of the parameters that I give into the pipelines that I have defined here. So each and every of the versions that you see up here is passed into this pipeline. And then in the deployment process, this is fetching a different artifact from S3, the one that is built within a pipeline, and is deploying exactly that version onto AWS. So if I actually made a change right now, as you can see here, this is my instance. And if we go actually to CloudFormation right now, you can see here, this is the stack that I commissioned initially. If we actually go and make a change now, which I want to do with, together with you, um, just have to, it's a little bit cumbersome. Um, I'm just going to do it on GitHub because it's way easier to do, do a simple change like that. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this say, Hello, dear fraternity, instead of hello world, because this is a friendly application and we'd like to greet it. Uh, we'd like to greet you right now. So, um, so right now we want to say hello to the fraternity. Hope I wrote it right, yes. And then I commit the change. And once we go back to our system, we see immediately it gets picked up because it's a hook within the GitHub repository. Uh, SnapCI is going to uh, pick this up, it's going to schedule my build, and it's going to go through each of these steps. You can see the runtime's already here, so this one's going to take 27, 26 seconds, around 11 seconds, and that one's going to take three minutes, because EC2 is really slow. I could have done this with Docker, obviously, it would be much, much faster, but I wanted to show the power of CloudFormation for now, and just to get you through the process by itself. So as you can see, the first stage passed. We're going to wait up right now. We're going to go back to this later. And I'm going to show you how the, how the process actually finished. But for the sake of actually being on time, uh, let's jump back to the presentation itself. This is, again, the URL. You'll find it on my GitHub account. I can show it to you later. But um, if you actually take a look at this pipeline right now, and you're, saying, you're telling yourself, OK, this, is, this seems to be really easy, right? This is a really small application. I think the most complicated part was CloudFormation. You can abstract that away if you're using a different provider. So is that really, is that really everything? Oh, that kind of uh, defeated the purpose. I don't know why it went away. OK, that's strange. I think it crashed, actually. I think it's the first time this, this, this presentation has crashed. That's amazing. So I'm just going to try to reload it. There we go. That's the one that I actually want to change, uh, so, uh, show you. OK, cool. So if this sounds a little bit too good to be true, yes, I have to give you that. It, I, there are a few caveats that you have to take a look at if you're running this continuous delivery immutable server approach, right? Uh, the grass isn't always green on the other side. So as I said before, infrastructure guy at heart, um, you always find the question, but who actually runs this, that server hardware where you're running all this stuff on, right? Nobody always wants to use a cloud provider. Sometimes you have to use bare metal. And uh, to that, I would say yes, it's definitely an issue. But then again, you have abstraction layers for how bare metal today as well, right? You should usually build smart and software and flexible 
uh, uh, private clouds instead of just having one single bare metal service. Even two servers can be a cloud where resources are abstractions and not actual physical resources on the machine. You can put those two together, throw something like OpenStack on it or SmartOS or RancherOS and uh, use Kubernetes or Mesosphere and actually abstract away what you would usually get from uh, a raw-like uh, environment where you don't have that. Or you use cloud providers like AWS, like the one that I do. You can build AMIs, or you can build digital ocean droplets, or you can build Heroku dynos, uh, or you use ISOs, as I said before, and just provide them to your hosting provider. And um, in the end, if you can't use all that, right, cloud or containers or whatever you want to call them, then at least try to abstract away some of the difficulties when it comes to bare metal management by using software management tools like Chef, Puppet, Ansible. That will lift some of the pain. It's no civil, it's no civil bullet, but at least it'll help you something. So now, and you'll ask yourself, who, who runs the continuous delivery pipeline then? Right? So I, I'm using a hosted provider right now, but not everybody wants to use, give away their software code, which is in a private depository to somewhere where you don't know where it's running or in wh which jurisdiction or whatever. And uh, if you have a, a continuous delivery uh, a life cycle, which is set up on a server, then you, you can't rebuild the continuous delivery server by itself. If you have an agent running and it's rebuilding itself, it'll just keep existing at one point in time. So, um, and so that, what I usually uh, recommend to people is to just build two of them. Build two of them and they're building each other. And they can both leverage the workload against each other. Each other. So if you have an update, you rebuild both of the systems one after another. Now, the hardest problem, unfortunately, in any case, is databases. So it usually says that in each software development cycle, you reach two bottlenecks. One of them is I.O. The other one is database. They're always chasing, chasing each other. If you have enough I.O., you end up actually squeezing too much data into the database. If your database is large enough, you probably end up having I.O. issues on the server. And so databases are an inherent problem to pretty much any software development process, and they're a problem for continuous delivery as well, because you cannot continuous deliver on, an, on a database, no matter what you do. They're a hard problem for pretty much any, uh, uh, for pretty much any environment, so um, especially if you have an evolving data structure, right? So if you have something that changes continuously in terms of data organization, it's going to be a problem. Um, so I have to say there is no silver bullet for databases here. And uh, um, you can do something like blue-green deployments, so you just aggregate all your data and you shove it onto your new database whenever you're actually deploying. Or you could use something like a tool like Large Hadron Migrator, which is a Ruby gem able to migrate large databases from one point to another and actually roll back in time as well if need be. Um, but um, in the end, you have to think about, do we actually need one huge point in time where all the data is stored? Maybe we need to move to a different data model, like event-driven data, consume events from services, and actually uh, uh, build a state table based on these events instead of having one single point of truth. Um, it happens to be one of the problems that you have to figure out by, on your own and ha have to find the right tool for the job for your given, for your given environment, essentially. So. As I said, let's jump back to our service really quickly and see whether it deployed. I hope the switch works this time. So as you can see, our pipeline actually passed. Everything is green. Uh, we hope that our service is deployed. The template that I committed as well was updated too. So it says shows an update complete. And if we go back and refresh, it says, hello, Defternity. And with that, I hope I've shown you that uh, continuous delivery and immutable servers are something to be considered, although there are a few downsides, right? I think the benefits are worth it. Thank you. So, questions? <laughs> Card. But the bottom of a business card. Okay, um, let's go back to the slide so everybody can see. Um, that is my GPG signature. So if you find my key online and you have my business card, you can definitely verify that it's me. If you've gotten the business card from me, obviously. So it might be some perpetrator running around with fake business cards. But yeah.